Allow me to tell you a story, one of a planet gasping for air, etched with the scars of indescribable loss, swinging at invaders and residents all the same. Listen closely, and perhaps we will hear echoes of a faraway plane telling the exact same story. The greatest good for the greatest number applies to the number within the womb of time, compared to which those now alive form but an insignificant fraction. Our duty to the whole, including the unborn generations, bids us restrain an unprincipled present-day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations. Our story begins in the warm glow of the midday sun. As the Feldegar rest on the rocks and the elves listen to the songs of the trees, if the world could speak, it would simply hum. Then the world trembled. It folded in on itself, trying to keep its grip on the chains it had held for millennia. In the end, it could not, and the titans emerged. These titans stood beyond the sun's zenith with twice its power. Each step they took left behind scars of gemstone, ash, and mystifying geometry. A band of heroes stood against them among a sea of dead bodies and fought with every bit of their strength. The planet itself aided them with its royal and fury. And in the end, the planet was saved and the titans defeated. But few would ever call it a victory. As the heroes left to chase the escaping titan, the world was left bleeding and its people mourning. Maybe they hoped the planet would fix itself and its people would flourish. Many years passed before our heroes would return, but return they did. Now, let's talk about what they were met with when they came back. It is also vandalism wantonly to destroy or to permit the destruction of what is beautiful in nature, whether it be a cliff, a forest, or a species of mammal or bird. Our heroes arrive in a flash as their feet land on hot sand and they breathe in dry air. As their eyes adjust to the light, they can see the outlines of rivers of stone flowing alongside the clouds, their colors fading into same grays and blues as the sky around them. Even as their jagged broken edges juxtapose the soft curvature of the clouds, they still seem perfectly at home. Low on the ground, they see the broken chain that once held the titans now rusting and disappearing into the sand, their failure making them undeserving of the blistering sun's rays. As they lay in the shadows in the foreground, midground, and background. In this land, only the earth itself stands above all else, the planet showing its perseverance above all things. As the heroes walk out of the desert in search for any sign of life, they pause alongside a twisting path, and for a moment take in the absolute beauty that can be found when there is no life. The world stills in this moment of appreciation, halting even gravity from disrupting the scenery. In just this one piece, we can see harsh shadows cutting into solid rock as the smooth light tans give way to some softness in the cliff's edge. In the distance, they see mountaintops that appear so massive that even from this distance, the heroes can point out where the dark browns show a cave entrance or even the hope of some trees. All this is beautifully done with only a singular color, resting on a blue gradient sky. The cliffs, the mountains, the path, the massive stones, the tiny pebbles, and even the murky puddles are all displayed with various tints and shades of burnt sienna that give flashes of the scars of some familiar world. As beautiful as this path is, it is a path the heroes must keep walking, so they go on to the next piece. They end up deep within the forest of Zendikar, pacing through thick foliage. Once again, they stop for a moment and appreciate the scenery. Here is one pattern that we will see across this planetary journey, the singularity of color. As before, there were ridges, plateaus, sky pillars, and even pebbles painted in burnt sienna. Here, the forest is pure green. From the deepest shadows to the brightest lights, every inch of this canvas breathes the singular mana it produces. Speaking of light, normally the deeper one ventures into a forest, the darker the wood becomes. Yet in this piece, the light shines brightest the deeper the forest goes. This is done to tell the viewer that the forest is not only a welcoming place, but a place that is kinder and safer than the outside world. As the heroes reach the center of the forest, they come across two more scars laying in the mid-clearing. 
Unlike those that were in the desert, these are brightly lit. Has the plane possibly forgiven these chains for their failure in keeping the titans locked away? One look at the trees answers no. Every trunk recoils at their presence and the pain they remind. But there is some hope here. Around the scars, flowers bloom in a variance of color seldom found in the forest of Zendikar. It is there that the plane shows its willingness to forgive, and its unyielding spirit. Beauty grows here only along the scars because the trees are too resentful to bloom. Maybe in some future the trees will learn to forgive, and flowers will bloom where the pain used to be. As our heroes leave the forest, they do something people rarely do. They looked up. High enough to where their backs aren't trying to see it, there was a gigantic stone ring broken up into various pieces. On top lay three volcanoes breathing out a constant stream of lava that poured into the sky and other stones. In the past, one would wonder how the lava hasn't run out. But years of pain tends to make one numb to royal. The volcanoes are but just half of this piece. On the other half of the arch, one can see the remnants of the old world struggling to be remembered. It is in this massive representation of Zendikar that our heroes are reminded that there is beauty in raw power. And likewise, there is sadness in a civilization struggling not to be erased. There is a delight in the hardy life of the open. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. As our heroes continue their journey through the scarred planet, they are reminded of something both majestic and terrifying. That as they walk through this land with the power to erase minds, raise cities in minutes, and command entire armies, they are but specks in the grandeur of nature. They take one look at the sky behind them and see just how small they are. They see a sky cliff so massive it makes the towers of New Prov seem like gruel rubble. Yet even it is dwarfed by the world around it. The sun shines enough to have its rays draw attention away from the ruin. Pieces of stone dance around it in the sky while laughing at its eternal fall. As the heroes begin their descent, they turn and face a forest of plateaus. For a moment, they're taken aback by their size. A hop won't be enough to cross them, but maybe a running jump? No, wait. What's that off in the lower right? Birds. Scale birds, to be exact. One of the oldest tricks in the art book, they fly freely delivering context and understanding to all viewers. Because if the birds are that small, then how big is that scar hiding by that shadow? If it's anything like the ones we've seen up close, then it's at least towering over a human being. If you continue the scaling, we see the plateaus wouldn't be crossed with any kind of jump. You would need a bridge in order to cross them. Those lines of pushed away grass lining all the tops are actually whole roads carved away by decades of adventurers. The birds did their job and made our heroes understand just how small they are. As large as they thought the planet was, it will always be bigger. Another example of the scale of this world comes when our heroes venture to the Copperline Gorge. Once again, first glances are deceiving, especially if you're seeing this across the table a foot away. It seems like just a cave opening on a mountainside. But now the heroes know to look for the birds, and where are they this time? Well, they're right here. Tiny, right? Well, with that context in mind, one can see how truly large this piece is. A fall from that small stream on the center bottom would kill almost any living creature. Moving upwards, those bushes are revealed to be entire forest that sprung to life within this broken gorge. Let's look at it from another perspective. Try to picture right now in your mind every creature that could live in a forest within Zendikar, from the smallest of bugs to the largest of beasts, an entire ecosystem within a blanket of trees. Now take everything that you're currently picture and realizing that it is all captured in a tiny fraction of this piece. And we're still just looking down. If we look up, we see the hanging lines that have saved more souls than any one person could remember, each floating island probably as large as the one we're currently standing on. One last thing to note here is the way this piece is framed. Both the horizon and the cave entrance are tilted in order to make the viewer feel disoriented. Moving further downward, our band of heroes arrive at a pathway through a river. This place echoes a lot of what was seen in the previous stop, so for the sake of brevity, I'll only speak of the new. For starters, in this piece the scale is not shown by birds, but by a merfolk on his... manta ray? I I'm not sure what they're called. I'm a storyteller, not a zoologist. 
but this frames the whole piece into a more up-close version of the previous piece. By doing this, it reaffirms how small one is in Zendikar, without needing to use the grand scale set pieces that we've seen previously. Even here, in a more localized perspective, the cliff faces on the left and right, paired with the dark water in the bottom, give the piece a constricting atmosphere. It may be a stretch, but the merfolk stand and position in the piece give off the vibe that they're exhausted. They just got out of this cave expecting a rest, but they're met with a winding river and so many more cliffs that they start to bleed into the sky in the background. This same sentiment meets our heroes when they reach a waterfall in their descent. How long have they been traveling so far? They can't even remember themselves. Yet they still haven't found any other person on this plane. They're tired, but they must keep going. In this spot, two things can be seen. The first is once again the use of scale. We see what appears to be a large core building broken and suspended over the waterfall as water rushes around them racing to the bottom. But once again, how big are they exactly? We'd normally look for the birds, but they don't seem to be flying around this piece. Just like the previous piece, it's actually a person being used as a scale bird. I'll give you a second to find them, because it took me a second as well when I first saw this. Right here. Now, I'm just going to break character here for a quick second because I need to defend this take. I looked at this piece for quite a while and came to the conclusion that these three brush strokes on the stone platform are meant to be the people standing. I mainly believe this because they're not rocks. The rocks falling around are very solid in opacity and have a very clear and defined line. They're not a motion blur either because as far as I could look, there weren't any strokes similar to these anywhere else on this piece. So because art cannot be objective, by nature, I'll simply claim that my interpretation of these strokes is that they are a representation of the humans for the sake of scale. Now, back to the story. The second thing one sees when looking at these falling skyscrapers is that on two of them it appears like the earth itself is keeping a grip around them. What could this mean? Is nature trying to hold the remnants of civilization up, or is it trying to force it down and overwhelm it? Those questions bounce between our heroes as they finally start reaching the bottom. What they come across is a true piece of beauty, both majestic and powerful. The birds here fly not just to tell us how large this cave opening is, but also to show us how deep it goes. Sunlight peers into the darkness revealing vibrant greens and violets. The shades are cool cerulean and grey. In this moment we're experiencing both the chilling sensation of a cavern and the warm release of an opening. We see the unknown darkness where we stand, but somehow the deeper we peer into the caves, the brighter and safer it seems. Which is a very peculiar thing to state, considering you can only see the lines of previous adventures in the darkness. But finally our heroes reach the bottom. Here they once again feel small and powerless. What's different this time is that they are overwhelmed not by large mountains or roaring waterfalls, but instead they are overwhelmed by the unknown. They can't see how deep this path goes what they could possibly run into. It could be a stretch to say that they don't even know what's a few steps ahead of them. The muted color palette and soft undefined brush strokes reinforce this feeling of unease and unknown. Now, let's see what our heroes find in the depths of this scarred land. I do not believe that any man can adequately appreciate the world of today unless he has some knowledge of a little more than a slight knowledge, some feeling for and of the history of the world of the past. Our heroes finally reach a semblance of civilization on their long journey through this struggling planet. But instead of bustling cities or even small encampments, they find ruins and emptiness. On this particular stop, we find a strange parallel between civilization and the wilderness. Zendikar across many years has struggled to keep itself together and keep it habitable for its people. In that very same manner here, the core buildings are struggling to keep themselves together in some way that echoes their past strength and rigidity. This can be seen by how the individually broken pieces are still positioned in the same way they would be before they crumbled away, forming a skeleton of the building that used to stand here. This is their first stop because it serves as an introduction to the concept that even long after death, the struggles of the people long gone can still be seen and felt across Zendikar. And equally so, Zendikar will try to erase any remnants of the people that used to live here. Instead of honoring their memory, it does this as a warning of what happens when you try to beat and dominate nature. 
Going deeper into the caverns, our heroes arrive in the ruins of Agadim. This place visually reeks of death and regret. What at first appears to be spikes in the architecture are actually dozens and dozens of those failed chains lining the walls like scars. In the background, they bury a statue that can only be assumed to be the leader of the people who used to live here. Seeing all this with their heroes surprisingly do not mourn the people that used to live here. Instead, they wonder, what could these people have done to make Zendikar resent them to the extent it flooded their ruins with dead chains? Our heroes then continue through the echoes of the core people and face a very difficult crossing. They each have to carefully walk and jump from thin platform to thin platform suspended in the air out of pure spite alone. As they carefully pace forward and contemplate every single hop, they notice how much of these ruins have been overpowered by Zendikar. This is the next theme we are going to look at. Zendikar, and by extension all of nature, will never let the ruins of a dead people rest in peace. Whatever remains, whether broken buildings, empty homes, upheaved pathways, everything will eventually be consumed back into nature. These lands of Zendikar simply show this process part way through. As much as the core ruins struggle to maintain the order they once had, they're being overpowered by dead branches and pale stone. This part of the journey will teach our heroes the inevitability of erasure if one isn't careful and leads their people to ruin. This lesson is then cemented further when they reach the branch loft pathway. Here, perspective and lighting are the main tools used to show the erasure of the core society. One starts on the dark left and is met at the beginning of the branch and the first core ruin. As one continues down the path, each ruin gets more and more broken down and overwhelmed by the branches. The first piece is solid, but by the last one it's just reduced to frail, thin pieces. Along the same path, the ruins and branches get brighter until you reach the winding sea of faded yellow in the background. Zendikar resents the core. It resents these ruins and believes that they bring darkness to the world, and by erasing any trace of them, the world may be healed. Now, whether or not this is correct is up to one's own personal beliefs and perspective. Even our heroes cannot agree on this. A nearby forest uses the same concept, but instead of erasing the ruins, it displays them like heads on a pike. Maybe one day when everything else is gone, these branches will tighten their grip and erase these as well. Finally out of the caverns, skyclaves, waterfalls, and pathways, our heroes reach a clearing facing yet another tower refusing to fall. As they walk towards it, they realize it's actually the tomb of a man whose people have long forgotten him. This piece does not induce a feeling of grief nor sadness. It doesn't even feel hollow nor foreboding. What I see here is a sign of pure stubbornness. Almost nothing in this piece moves. The pillars surrounding the tomb stand perfectly perpendicular to the horizon. They parallel the central balance point of the statue itself, unyielding even when missing an arm. Horizontally we have the steps, the horizon of course, and the tomb itself. These lines alone create a rigid composition, but it doesn't stop there. If we look at the bottom of the piece, the shadows, the fallen pillars in the background, and the individual etchings on the stone, we see a myriad of triangles further reinforcing these perpendicular lines. This piece is stubborn because of its structure. This prison of line stops any movement from happening, just like the tomb of this man refuses to fall to the passage of time. The only things that move in this piece are the souls that fly around the tomb. Their blue color and flowing structure tells that they are not part of this tomb, but simply visiting apparitions of the nature that looks to finish erasing it. Going forward, our heroes' hopes of finding any life grow ever fainter, as they've seen since they've started their journey was a beautiful world whose sole purpose is to erase the people who used to inhabit it. As they reach the end of the clearing, they face a crossroad. On their left, they see nothing. Not even death. Just nothing. Here, no water flows, no grass grows, no people frolic, and there isn't even a singular bug to swat away. A floating ring against a dark sky would normally be a sign of power to our heroes, but here, it's the last bit of life, withering away into dust, flying into the heavens because it's been exiled by the very earth. Even the colors that adorn this planet have been told to leave. All life here is rejected and only the wasteland remains. In disgust, our heroes turn to the left and see another wasteland, but this one not so somber. They see a mirror that reflects the earth reaching for the sky. The cool faded blues of the sky and the water set a balanced backdrop that allows us to focus on the rocks and the beach. The themes of this piece are contact and singularity. 
The rocks jump out at the sky, hoping to reach the heavens. The two opposite shorelines try to touch one another, but never do. If we look at the center, the only thing connecting the left and right shorelines is the swan perched on the semi-submerged scar. This swan right here is the only connecting point in this piece. It connects the two shorelines to each other and the scar. It also connects the stones to their own reflection. What this swan represents, I'll touch upon in a second because I want to cover how it's the only singular thing in this piece. Everything here is doubled, either by a reflection like the stone, or having two of them like the shores, or even a color being used twice like the blues and whites of the sky and sea. Even the small stones on the shoreline have a twin pair on the opposite side. But the swan does not. It doesn't even have a reflection in the water. When I noticed this, I started wondering why. What purpose did it serve to not have a reflection? Ultimately, my interpretation is that the swan represents a rebirth of life on this plane, or at the very least, in this specific region. Think about how symbolic a fresh sprout of a plant would be in a forest bed after a fire. This is an image that we've seen countless times in art, and effectively, the same symbolism is used here, but just in a different setting than the one we're used to seeing. This swan then is what ties the entire piece all together in a nice little bow. So back to again to our heroes as they stand between these two opposing horizons and must choose where to go. Will the plane die off as a wasteland or will life begin anew? Now, let us see what is left of this world. Here is your country. Cherish these natural wonders. Cherish the natural resources. Cherish the history and romance as a sacred heritage for your children and your children's children. Do not let selfish men or greedy interests skin your country of its beauty, its riches, or its romance. A young adventurer and their deer hop from stone to stone, not caring that any slip could send them on a fall that would take minutes to reach impact. All they care about is the freedom of the open air. The rush each jump gives and the warmth of a rising sun granting them purpose and hope. This same sun later as it descends also guides another explorer. This one uses a pole to hop from stone to stone. The lines here have remained unmoved and unbroken, implying the stones have stopped shifting and the path is now a safe one. The lighting here joins the sun and the explorer as a singular being. Maybe they're just a beginner. Maybe when they return home, they'll be overshadowed by greater adventures in their family. But in this moment, in this jump, they are the center of the world and the sun agrees and focuses on them and them alone. Somewhere off, a grand tree grows on a rock and its roots mirror the architecture of the core stone buildings, its triangular structure hinting at a possible acceptance of the people who used to be here, or possibly a memorial to their losses. Its vines draping from stone to stone also mirror the lines left behind by adventurers and the leaves stick to the ground like their grappling hooks. Here nature doesn't ridicule nor does it erase, instead it teasingly pays tribute to those daring enough to scale its peaks. Finally, off on a river, we see a rebuilt structure signaling to the world that its people are here. Its people will live, its people will flourish, and no matter what happens, they will persevere. In response, the animals sit and stare in respect, the river flows to show its prone perseverance, and the clouds block the sky in a sign of power. The people say they will live on. The world responds, you can try. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this nice little journey through the plain of Zendikar. It is extremely late. This video was supposed to come out late like late October, maybe early November, and it is currently recording time November 28th, and I have no goddamn idea how long it's gonna take me to edit all this and get it published out to y'all. So, um, happy holidays if they're coming up, or happy new year if that's when this ends up coming up. We'll see, we'll see when it comes over here. Um, I should explain myself as to why this took so long. Uh, after these stories of Zendikar, I took like a two week break to just, uh, unwind from the crash that I had after doing nine videos in a month, but, after that, I just started working on the architecture of Zendikar, but partway through that script, I just threw it all out because I didn't like the way it was looking at, and kind of got this wild idea to do um, a parallel between Theodore Roosevelt's journey through the, the United States of America, using a lot of his quotes, and then mirroring that with the journey through the land of Zendikar. So hopefully uh, it's not too silly, 
it was a crazy idea that I did. It's not really my typical structure. I tried something different, so let me know if it works out well enough for you guys. But I'd like to thank my friend uh, ALK Alters, who did the voice for Theodore Roosevelt. He's an amazing artist that does a bunch of like alternate arts and proxies for magic cards. I'll leave a link to his Instagram and his Twitter down on the description. He actually just did, well, just as of this recording, released a series of cards uh, displaying the various national parks found in the United States founded by Theodore Roosevelt, which we didn't plan that. I didn't plan that at all with him. So when I saw them, it was like, damn, that's interestingly coincidental. So uh, go check them out. I'll link to those down, down below as well. And uh, as to where we go from here, I have no idea. We'll see what other ideas come in. Uh, leave in the comments what kind of ideas you want me to tackle or what kind of thematics and artworks you want me to go around in. I don't really have that much interest in Kaldheim. I don't know enough about, like, um, Nordic legends or Nordic things to do anything of that. I was thinking about doing Eldraine, but everybody and their mother already did Eldraine, so I feel like I'd just be regurgitating a lot of what other people have done. Like, if you want to see a video on Eldraine, go watch a Ristic Studies videos on it, which is majestic. I think it's a perfect video. He's a grand inspiration of mine. But aside from that, right now I'm currently planning a little side project with some other artists. We will look at that when it comes up. But as to where we go from here, I don't know. I might try to do the Simic Guild if I run out of other ideas, but other than that... I think I'll see y'all next year, or later this year, depending on this came out. Goodbye for now.